Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and for helping us celebrate Davy Williams. I am lucky enough to have met Davy and LaDonna when I was 16 years old. It was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And that profoundly changed me in my life, in the course of my life, as I'm sure it did many of us. And um, that led me to a life in dance, in improvisation. It led me to my dearest community and my life partner and all the people that I adore. So here we are so thankful that we still have our LaDonna Smith on the planet. And we still have our Susan Hefner. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Davy Williams commemorative concert here at Roulette and um, it's my pleasure to say a few words to you before we start and uh, I had asked um, Ann LeBaron if she would write a few things. Ann LeBaron's uh, one of our collaborators in the early days and, uh, and uh, now she's a very well known and respected American woman composer and uh, she could not be here so we'd like to invoke her now you know to come down with her words. Um, the way she uh, wrote this, uh, I think I can just tell the story of a couple of uh, things that are going on with, this, with, with what's on, on her thing. And uh, the first thing I'd like to say is how Davy and I met, uh, Anne LeBaron introduced us. And um, she invited me to go to the county fair. And so um, I said, okay, I'll go to the county fair. And so she shows up in this large, long gold cutlass and uh, with tail fins, the whole nine yards, and, uh, and it's loaded with all these men. And so I wound up having to sit in the lap of, I think, somewhere close to uh, Big Jim and Mitchell Cashin, and uh, it, it was very uncomfortable. But um, all of a sudden, I, I really had no idea where we were going. Uh, we wound up in this county fair. There were like pigs and, you know, barnyard smells and all this kind of stuff. And she went and bought everybody tickets. And we were in line and, uh, for the Ferris wheel and she put Davy and I together uh, to go on the Ferris wheel and we did. And so here we are, we're going around and around. And uh, all of a sudden the Ferris wheel stops on the very top. So we had to talk to each other. And that's how we really met. And so it's so weird that we would be on a Ferris wheel, you know, looking down at all these, you know, barnyard animals and stuff. But we talked about music and we made a point to get together and the rest is history. We um, are collaborators for life in a way, spreading uh, the gospel of free improvisation along with uh, probably most of you all. And uh, that's where it came from. I would like to read um, from her writing. She says, Davy was so much more than a musician, dedicating himself to painting and writing while engaging in his own idiosyncratic and refreshing philosophical ruminations. For me, and I'm sure others who knew him, he was endlessly inspiring and always transporting, conjuring rapid fire gestures and sound for of untold numbers of people on his countless performance tours. And uh, no doubt that's true. She then tells a story, which I remember of uh, she and Ed uh, had a delayed kind of wedding party. Uh, her husband was, uh, had a remote assignment, you know, in Korea and China and stuff. So they came back and it was at Davy's parents' house down in Greene County, uh, Alabama. And so what do they do? They pull out this bottle of, uh, I guess it was wine. I'm not sure, I don't even remember what it was, but it had this huge lizard inside the bottle. And so we were all expected to pass it around, you know, and have a, a bit of that lizard. Oh my God. And she, of course, she wouldn't take, uh, she wouldn't drink it, but we did. Um, the last thing I want to uh, share is, she says, Davy's generosity as a fellow musician and improviser was palatable. For instance, here's what he shared with me as Sid. Sid's Charisse, his alter ego. 
uh, when he listened to her concerto for Active Frogs at the 2013 Redellinus reunion, he was backstage with Reverend Fred Lane. And he said, and she's quoting him, he, she said, he said, distinction between the hylas and the homos and the horns was not easy, at times impossible. Made for an oddly calm place in that backstage area, which became a, let us say, surreal nighttime outdoor environment, one of those movie scene dream moments where Sid and Fred are in a dark alley in the middle of a strangely lyrical swamp, changing clothes, prehensile contrails as always. Sid, thank you very much.
You studied with Johnny Shines, who studied with Robert Johnson. That's right. Which means that you touched somebody who was touched by Robert Johnson. In other words, you touched somebody who touched somebody who touched the devil. And can you tell us about that demonic transmission process and what it's meant to your play? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you what, uh, Phoebe. Uh, now, there's this stories that Robert Johnson uh, went to the crossroads and met the devil and got his playing from him. But in truth, Johnny Shines told me that uh, back in those days in Mississippi, there was no doctors. And it's just as good a chance that Robert Johnson died from a stomach ulcer as from the devil. And Johnny Shines never re really believed anything except that, uh, that uh, Robert Johnson was just incredibly inspired and practiced his ass off and got real good. He was real good, Robert Johnson, uh, at uh, learning songs off the radio. He didn't just play blues, you know. Played anything anybody wanted to hear. He could listen to records and, I mean, listen to the radio. They didn't really have record players, you know, back then. I mean, they did, but he basically just got real good in the same way that Jim Staley got real good, you know, or something. Just, just learn it, you know. I have a feeling that Johnny Shines is right. Johnny moved to Tuscaloosa in 1965 after his daughter died, leaving him in charge of 10 grandchildren. The grandchildren are grown now, but he has two new stepchildren. He and Candy, his wife of two years, share with them a modest home in the countryside near Tuscaloosa. But he and Candy share more than that. Big wheels keep on turning, and I proud keep on burning. I say, roll it, roll it, roll it on the river. I say, roll it, roll it, roll it on the river. I'm a rhythm and blues singer by trade, more or less. Uh, I do a little of everybody, you know, I like all music. That first time I saw him play in concert, acoustic, it just blew me completely away. He's been a very big influence on my music. He's teaching me a lot of the blues because I'm doing some blues shows with him. He's working with me more and more every day, and I'm just really happy and thrilled about that. And some of the people that he's, he has taught how to play, and it's, it's just really into it, and they're, they've copied his style of playing. And, you know, that is just something to see. It's just something, you know, to have all come around and sit here with us and then start to playing and they be playing like Johnny, you know. That is something. It's, oh, it's exciting. Take your eight and your ten. You should be watching out, baby. Try to say the trick again. Well, David, when David was so young, when I met him, I had to get permission from his parents to work him. <laughs> I learned to love the boy. And as, as a, one of my family or something like this, you know? I'm very comfortable with him around me. Because he seemed to want to look out for me, see that nothing happened to me, and nothing happened to my property or anything like that, you know? In return, well, all I could do was teach him what I knew. Davey Williams, says Guitar Player Magazine, is one of the three founding fathers of American free improvisational guitar. He and his partner, LaDonna Smith, have released nine albums and are about as likely to be seen performing in Brussels, West Berlin, or Zurich as they are in their hometown of Birmingham. There's still a, a, a technical musical influence from Johnny that's pr pervasive, 
But uh, more than that, even more pervasive, and what's really stuck is the, is the, the dedication to it, you know. So he, he sees, for one thing, giving lessons as, as spreading the blues, you know, and, and, and keeping it going. She's a kind hearted woman. But I, th I think another aspect to it is he's just a very nice, generous guy who's, who's willing to give of himself in that way, too. I, I enjoy working with anybody. I want to learn to play. To be able to make people feel good about their music, you know, that I've taught them. Now, that's my high. <laughs> that's my high. Well. Davy loved Johnny, and um, he, 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 Davy met Johnny uh, in high when he was in high school. He got a guitar. He loved the guitar. I don't know. I think maybe he saw something on the Ed Sullivan show that might have turned him on to electric guitar. But from that point, um, his dad looked for a guitar teacher in Utah, Alabama, and of course, who would you find down in the county? of uh, Lower Alabama, as we call it, L.A., in uh, the South. And uh, he found Johnny Shines in Tuscaloosa, so the relationship began with uh, Davies playing with Johnny, um, well, taking some guitar lessons, and uh, he had an act for it. And uh, Johnny asked him if he would um, come and play some gigs. He, I think he thought that might be a, a good learning experience. So at a very early age, um, Johnny wrote a letter uh, for, uh, to his father, and his father uh, uh, took the letter, and it was uh, giving, well, actually, Haney wrote the letter to Johnny that gave permission for Davy to travel with Johnny on some local uh, county gigs and uh, some local juke joints. And that was um, uh, a very motivating, gravitating experience for Davy. It was a bit scary for him, uh, but, he was like thrown into performance really at an early age. Yeah, he's the one that showed me the very most important and most basic stuff for me, for my style of playing and for the type of playing that Johnny played and as near as I can tell the way Robert Johnson and many other slide players played, though not all I've come to find out, is that the slide must fit well on your finger and you play it on this finger and you, certain techniques so that, you know, to mute the notes so that you play, you know, because if you just play slide, you know as well as I do, you know, if you just lay a slide on a, and start plucking notes, man, it just sounds like a mess because all these other notes are coming out too, you know. It's stuff like that, just basic, but also, you know, the, the, the essence of how songs move, you know those kind of songs, you know. Well, this is it, man. <laughs> Webb's Night Spot. The first gig with Johnny Shine. Somewhere around 71. But uh, an interesting thing, that we, we took the stage, Davey and I were talking about it last weekend. We took the stage about nine o'clock at night, and Davey and I were standing somewhere right here, smoking cigarettes, and we were looking out across here, and the sun was coming up. So we played uh, you know, an eight hour gig, first gig with Johnny. The place was packed. This up. Now let's go in. Oh man. <laughs> okay. None, none of this. None of this stuff was here. It was open. You know, it, it was just a. But we 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 sat up right here. And as you can see, the roof. I remember the roof is smaller, is lower than this. I remember thinking, God, this roof is low. But uh, they were taking up money right there. We were right here. Uh, and this is where it happened. 
We played all night. It was packed. I bet there were 150 people in here. And you know, you look around. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it was it was a packed house. And this was the first gig. Uh, what was it like for you as a, a, a young white kid? You know, had you played in a in a, a place like this before? Or was it? No, I, I actually uh, back to that morning when we walked out this door right here. Uh, Davy and I stood out there, and, and I swear, man, I don't even think we knew it. The sun was coming up. You know, it, it was twilight, you know, or dawn. And the sun was coming up, and we were standing there, and I and I and I never forget it. You know, we. I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday, and we were just kind of like in shock. And uh, and Davy's uh, Davy looks up at me, and he goes, "Man, this is what it's all about." I said, "You're damn right," you know. And of course, we had. You know, that was the first gig, so we just really. We figured, you know, the, the world, is, the sky's the limit. You know, the world was our oyster, literally. You know, we were, here we came, you know. We were, we were some kids, we were stuck in the blues, you know. And I mean, we were, do, we were doing it, we were living it, you know. And uh, so that was it. The, the blues, the, the interesting thing, I think one of the most interesting things that... Um, David came out of that experience with was the uh, technique of slide guitar. Um, and so he took that to new levels. That was one of the things that, uh, that he did. And uh, he would play slide guitar with almost anything. He would play it with uh, a cup, uh, with a spoon, uh, with rocks. Uh, he uh, was very interested in the sonic aspects, you know, and the the wavy kind of like forms. Um, he loved the, the whammy bar. He would use that, you know, to go up and down. So this sense of a roller coaster ride uh, was very much a part of his, his ethnos. And so um, that just expanded on, you know, to, to continue to create more sonic uh, properties from uh, the use of objects or the use of small toys, the use of uh, small motors and um, some of his motorized um, instruments that he used, like the motorized baseball glove, the motorized Godzilla uh, plastic gorilla. Uh, he used uh, shav shavers and to uh, electric toothbrushes and any number of kind of household objects and other more surreal kind of like found objects that he, he might find, you know, uh, on the side of a a, a railroad track or something like that. He was completely interested in what these various implements would do. And if they didn't do um, enough, he would discard them and he would find something else like his um, tape measure. where He would pull out his tape measure to about six or seven, maybe eight feet as much as he and he would just flail that thing, you know, and just you know, have all of this kind of sound. That was one of his more frightening moments. What did that relationship mean for Davy? I mean, I, I know, but I was wondering if you could just sort of talk about it a little bit more in depth. In his terms of, relationship with Johnny? Yes, and what it meant to him oh, personally. Oh, it was uh, near Godlike, you know. Not only, he showed him how to play slide, and that was, but he also showed him how to be, well, he showed him what hardcore music business was like. Uh, he told him to really, that's why Davy went into, I think, you know, Davy knew he could have been any booked out blues player. But, uh, I think Johnny encouraged him to just find his own, make, create his own music. He too saw more in Davey than just being a blues player, maybe. And uh, and he told Davey one important thing: play guitar, do not sing. Why did he say that? <laughs> he knew Davey couldn't sing. 
He we, knew Davy was not a blues singer. Now he knew Davy could be a blues player. Hence that gig that they did here at the local at the local blues festival. And it might have been, it's, it was one of the major league times that Johnny Shines played that festival. Uh, and Davey was with him, hence that photograph we were talking about with uh, Bo McGee and Davey and uh, Johnny Shines. It was blistering hot. I bet Blues Festival is always the third weekend of August. And in, in Alabama, the Black Belt, it is usually blisteringly hot at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, on that occasion, Davey was equally blistering hot on his last poll. And Johnny Shine said into the mic to the crowd, now listen, don't you ever let anybody tell you a white man cannot play blues. anybody who was outside the box and was non-linear in their in their thinking and uh, you know we had certain people we both liked a lot and I guess the connection was Johnny Shines I mean this guy rode the train with Robert Johnson that's the shroud of Turin to me that's my religion right there and uh, you know, I saw this guy playing with him, and I went, God, who is that? Not, I mean, Johnny Shines is not, but the guy playing with Johnny Shines has got to be somebody. I had no idea he was from outer space. I had no idea he was an electrician from outer space. He does surgery. He doesn't play music, it's surgery. It's out, outer space surgery. So we all have it, we just, cover it up, you know, out of fear or whatever, or, you know, people won't think we're good players, we're good musicians, you know, whatever. And um, so Bruce used to try to force us to access that. But then, you know, you meet somebody, he's like, I want you to meet Davey Williams. This guy's the king. You know, you need to learn from him, you know. So when we saw Davey, we were just like, oh my God. This guy's completely outrageous, you know. But uh, you know, you would you'd be very uh, mistaken to take Davy lightly, you know. He's very serious, you know, a really gifted musician as far as playing regular music or whatever, you know. So it does surprise me he played with Johnny Shines, you know. Um, and I think it's something unique, really, about the South because you have guys like Derek Bailey. You know, this brokenness is is uh, universal. It doesn't just come from the blues. But there's something unique about these cats that are from the Deep South that did latch on to the blues, you know. Uh, and it's a different... Thing it's not like the New York out guys or the anybody anybody's avant-garde. Let me touch on two things about Davy that make uh, his his guitar playing special. Uh, one is the connection to the blues because Davy grew up listening to country blues. He had a close association with Johnny Shines. Learned to play blues a lot from him. Played many gigs with him. And Eugene Chatterbone and I. We listened to blues records, is in our playing, but we weren't really there in the middle of it. We weren't playing in the juke joint. You know, we weren't having the cops come and look at us on stage and say, what's that white boy doing up there? Um, we didn't have somebody like, like Johnny Shines take us under his wing and treat us like a son. And 
you know, America's always a big melting pot of musical traditions. That's a cliche, but it's true. And in improvised guitar and extended guitar and crazy guitar, there's always a blues connection with Davy. That doesn't mean there's the, there's the blues scale. It's a sense of a presentation, of connection to the audience, to the rest of the universe. He learned a lot of special things that the rest of us didn't learn that made his gumbo the flavor that it is. Well, what I appreciated about Davy's playing was the fact that he really could play. I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to hear someone who has a completely original approach. They may not have traditional technique, but they, they have a sound and they do that. I mean, when I first started playing, before I could move my hands around properly on the neck, there was, you know, you, you, you hear a sound and you try and go for it. And with Davy, I felt like he had a sound that he was working for, and yet it was tied up with a kind of uh, authority of hand and ear that comes from someone who has played a lot of tradi traditional music. And when I found out that he was a blues hound and was playing with blues players, that made it all the more important for me. Because the thing about blues playing, it transforms the guitar from a kind of very Apollonian, very cool pitch-based instrument to some, into something that's very vocal. You hear especially the Delta blues guitars playing with a slide or uh, guitars like Albert King and B.B. bending notes. You know, they're putting passion into the manipulation of the note. They're transforming it from a pure tone into something that's very vocalized, very uh, Dionysian, you know, uh, passionate, uh, that, a cry from the heart. And you could hear, even if, when David was playing with like a, a, a you know, a, a kitchen, uh, what do you call those things, you know, like a, an egg whisker or, a, you know, a bolt, you could say, and he's singing. I, I, I was very interested in sounds that did not sound like the guitar, but coming from a guitar, and phrases and note patterns and stuff that did not sound like music I already knew, you know, trying to play, listening to new jazz or the mothers or some, you know, other, whatever it might be, mothers of invention stuff, whatever it might be. But in the sense of taking blues and taking that out. Uh, Davey coined the term convulsive blues in a number of his writing pieces. And um, thinking on what that might mean, I, I believe it had a lot to do with uh, taking things to extreme, like the, uh, the flailing of, you know, playing, you know, along and having the slide guitar go and, and taking it away from the blues, but moving it into an atmospheric, more um, uh, authentic, uh, abstract way. It would have a lot of energy, it would still have maybe a driving rhythm. Uh, it might have um, some of his implements, you know, like creating explosions or whatnot, those kind of sounds, you know, and then just the flailing and then coming back. He would always bring it back to a musical level, you know, with, with maybe the throbbing sound. But yeah, he, he loved to get away from the blues, but it was hard for him to actually get away from it. So, you know, he did write a bit about the convulsive aspect of um, taking music, you know, out of just the lyrical zone and moving it into something that was more sonic, that had uh, energy and force, maybe like dynamite. I am very excited about David. I, am, I want him to grow past what John expected him to grow and new music, always new music is it. If you don't have that that feeling in your heart about what could happen in the future, because see, the music he's making now is probably going to be the music for the future. You know, and, and people are going to tune in and they're going to say, where was, this? where was I at? You know, I didn't think this would happen. You know, you know when you get right, it's just like when you're moaning the blues, as John would say. If you moaning the blues, you know, People say, well, how do you know something about the blues? Because I done felt it, I done lived it, I know it. And David has felt it, and he's lived it, and he knew about it because he was so young 
back then when uh, when John was teaching us, because John taught us what he wanted us to know, something that would accomplish something in the future for us. See, even though I'm 60 years old, I still feel that, you know, I'm broke down, but I can always get back up. <laughs> called worse too. <laughs> Thank you. 
conspicuously missing partner in this grouping who was originally intended to be programmatically included. Uh, that man, uh, to say it the way our friend Dennis Palmer would say it, that man would be Jack Ryan. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, he was dubbed uh, none other than by David Williams as the uh, Johnny Appleseed of free improvisation and wrote the foreword to his first book. This is not that book, but just you know a brief passage he said, unnoticed by any observers is the self-created enjoyment that has arisen spontaneously as substitute for the commons, a throwback to the days when people played music or wrote for the sake of enjoyment. Free playing, if I may dwell on my own turf here, is just that, inefficient and worthless, not even a subculture. No advantage of prestige or financial gain, no privilege is obtained. This is its basic distinction from the avant-garde, a career-oriented music that must satisfy the NGOs that fund it and media that makes it visible. Free improvisers are not marginalized. That would be to accept the terms of exchange value, one sound worth more than another. Free playing, along with all the other purposely under the radar music, gets nothing in return, which is just what it expects and deserves. <laughs> Here's looking at you, Sid. Yeah. Sid, I like that. Yeah, dancing. Who would have thought? Or thunk? <laughs>
Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, meet Johnny Williams. relationship was extremely special. My only brother, and uh, just, uh, he was my inspire, and we collaborated in so many things. I'm not a musician. I am intensely interested in surrealism and automotism, free thought, open thought. I'm an armchair philosophy type guy. And what Bruce was talking about, electricity. Uh, that was, Davey was a musician and with an electric guitar and all that time I was this electrician in power plants and you know it was a really interesting parallel there because uh, of, uh, of uh, sine waves and frequencies and hertz and magnitudes. And uh, all of energy goes back to electricity, the energy of plants, the energy of chemistry. And Davey and I would have these way out there conversations about the nature of uh, energy, improvisation, convulsiveness. And that thing about convulsive beauty or convulsive blues applies to all of this, and that is the power of convulsive energy, the power between this, the voicings of instruments and the reverberations and all that, but most importantly, the power of energy between people. And so I had a list of everybody to thank, but everybody's been thanked by the uh, opportunity to be able to play together and get to know each other and perform together. But most especially, I want to thank our parents, Haney, L. Williams, and Ulita B. Williams. And you know that L in Haney's middle name, his name was Haney Love Williams. I always wondered about that. But what was special early on when Davey was in his high school days, meeting Tim Reed, and uh, he was in Tuscaloosa getting to know these people and uh, Davey would bring folks to Utah and uh, hang out. A lot of these people here kind of knew through Utah. Uh, I recall a while back, early on, uh, John Zorn came through Utah coming out of Mississippi and picked up Davey and LaDonna to come up here and do some gigs in uh, New York. And uh, this is how they influence people. So my mom, you come to the house, and they were, uh, you know, would welcome you in and cook you dinner. And uh, I remember watching John Zorn watching cornbread bake in the oven. <laughs> this amazement. And uh, but that really goes back to to the where Davy and I were coming from. It's because Haney and Alita were very uh, compassionate of uh, humans and sharing people and trusting people and allowing us, Davey and I, to, uh, uh, they encourage us to be ourselves and find our way and we found our way and it's a very, very interesting stuff. Davey was kind of my guide. He would like always introduce me to books and concepts and we would sit around the house and his house or anywhere we had a chance. We kept notebook, collective drawings, and just these uh, improv conversations that would go wherever they went. So I'm grateful for that. And uh, the folks are gone now, and Davey's gone now, but uh, all of y'all 
all of the people in this community, all of the people that loved and supported Davy, including all of y'all, are members of our family. The family of creativity, the family of communication, the family of respect, and the family of mutual uh, understanding. So every time, uh, whatever you do, play from your heart, play to the play to humanity, play to the world. And I think free improvisation is one of the best examples of that because it's not a whole lot of preconception and it's, uh, it exists in its own world. We're just lucky enough to live in it. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you all. Amen. And now, Clifford McPeak has uh, created uh, arrangements of three of Davy's solo his, uh, three of his guitar solos. And so, thank you, Clever. Come on.